But I, I'm, I'm going to kind of do you all a little bit of a favor here today. Because this, uh, this is quite comprehensive. Thanks. Thanks. We've really never, as a department, I guess it's that for you. Oh, oh, have we oh, ever oh, done. Uh, well, you no. need to be yeah, well, I mean, it, the, we haven't, we've never really done a five year plan, extended plan. And we took the opportunity here to, to not only do that, but we're looking really close at Grant, and the both of them will go together, if that makes sense. Uh, but rather than hear me stammer and stutter, uh, Jerry's a... I guess, uh, You'll hear me stammer and stutter and I guess it's because he's such a young man now that uh, uh, his oh. presentation will be more interesting if I need to step in or y'all got any questions. I is here. So as Chief alluded to, we took this this year to really do a comprehensive self-analysis of our uh, fire and rescue delivery system, to look at our current uh, staffing levels, to look at our volunteer staffing levels, um, and really look at what our calls for service have been, to try to really project where we are at today and where are we going to be at in five years. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be able to meet uh, the call demand? Are we going to be able to meet the requirements of emergency service within a five-year period? With, and, and what will we need as far as resources to be able to do that? Uh, Chief maybe set out and he made sure that anything that we did needed to be realistic and attainable goals. Certainly we could come before you and say we need 50 people. And we know that that's not realistic or attainable because certainly we, we have to look at what is in the best interest of the citizens as well as what is affordable to the taxpayer. Okay, so, uh, so realistic and attainable is really what we looked at. We looked at the historical data of our organization. So we really dove into where we were at 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, and today. Look at calls for service. Uh, look at how long, as far as how long did an EMS call take a unit out of service 10 years ago versus today. All right, and that number has changed. So as we see our community demographics change, as we see the levels of service change, we start to see those types of things affect our fire and EMS delivery system. We use a couple different reference documents. And if you so desire, I can send you links to those documents. Understanding and implementing standards, and particularly we looked at that from the 1720 standard. We'll talk about that in detail, but brief in a few minutes. We really looked at the state of the volunteer fire service report uh, that was released at the end of 2018. Uh, that was done off of a grant uh, through a FEMA grant to where they really looked at where the volunteer fire and EMS services are across the nation and what needs to change to kind of revive some of that. It's the first type of its document that's been uh, released as far as it goes into the fire, volunteer fire and rescue system um, and actually one of our community members uh, serves on that committee. He lives in the Shenandoah Farms, now works, he was recently hired as the uh, chief of volunteer services for Loudoun County at a deputy chief's level. So we have that resource right in our backyard to be able to tick. So Are you involving the company of the volunteers? Are you having regular meetings with the volunteer company chiefs? And, and it, it, with regards to this, we have not. With regards to our recruitment and retention services, we are. Uh, Brenda Deal, our recruitment and retention coordinator, has a committee member from each respective volunteer station. Um, she meets with them on a regular basis to talk about what are, what are the challenges are you seeing, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, and how do we go from there. So that's one of her task functions, and to report that back. Um, and she's, she's just about ready to do a comprehensive report out there, because we still have some of these questions as to once we go through the orientation and turn them over to the companies, we kind of lose control. Uh, but do you talk to these company chiefs regularly? I, I'd say yes. I, I don't know exactly what regularly means, but... I mean, you, but, you have um, like quarterly, monthly meetings or anything like that? We have not 
recently. I think because of everybody's workload, but we are getting ready to start those up again. We're going to try them quarterly uh, the, to put out there. But she does. Uh, she not the chief. No, no. But <laughs> but I, I will say this. I will say this is you know the chiefs don't always have all the answers either because they're tied up with operations and and other things. So what she does is she. She has her committee of people, uh, appointees, or whether they were elected or appointed at the company level, that are are doing at the local level what she does at the county level, if that makes sense. So really look, diving into those reports, we looked at fire service deployment, assessing the community's vulnerability, uh, as well as NFPA 1720 and that standard, and the 2018 Safer Grant Guidelines. As you are well aware that we applied for the, the grant in 2018, we were not successful. Uh, so we really looked at and took this plan and evaluated what the guidelines were for 2018 and how can we move to uh, make our grant request, if you should so choose to proceed, successful. And that really hinges on that 1720 guideline. This a uh, report that you have in front of you outlines five strategic staffing objectives. The first objective, the 24-hour staffing of Rivermont Fire Station. And we have that investment that uh, you so graciously approved, getting ready to break ground, come back from bid process, um, so to really dive into, let's provide 24-hour staffing for that area. To increase staffing in our high call volume stations, increase our fire and rescue floater positions, staffing additional support service positions, and increase community fire and rescue uh, volunteer retention. The methodology and overview continued. This report calls for 26 uniform positions over the next five years. Okay, uh, And I know that seems like a lot. We're going to dive into really how did we achieve and come up with that number. Again, it's spread over a five-year period. This plan provides three implementation strategies. One we know is not realistic, uh, but it just gives you a, pretty much an option of, hey, this is how we could do it, or this is how we think is best. It considers the financial burden to the taxpayer. Certainly, uh, you all know more about that than we do. You all are the ones that take the calls during this climate, uh, but certainly we're enough to to where we can read the newspapers and, and Chief's going through the budget process with you now on, on what the burden is and the decisions you have to make. But ultimately, our choice was to try to meet the long-term and current needs of our organization. Really looking at NFPA 1720, the standard on organization and the de deployment of fire suppression operations, EMS operations, and special operations, by public volunteer fire departments. And when I say volunteer, that includes combination type departments. I'm going to show you a quick little video. This is on NFPA 1710. 1710 is the standard for career department. Okay? So then we'll talk about the difference. You may have heard about NFPA 1710, the industry standard for career fire departments. But what is it? And what does it mean for our community? You have some life. It's your worst nightmare. In just three minutes, a fire can grow 16 times larger than when it started. And it continues to grow bigger and faster every second. Once the clock starts ticking, there's a shrinking window of opportunity to save lives and property. You want a full crew of firefighters to put it out quickly, or you may suffer a catastrophic loss. But how many are enough? 50? 20? 40? How do you decide? Fortunately, there's an internationally recognized industry standard. It's called NFPA 1710, and it's based on scientific evidence and research that establishes how many firefighters are needed to put out each fire rescue anyone trapped. 
At a fire scene, you want a firefighter doing every job that needs to be done to save you and your house. And at a fire, there's a lot that needs to be done. Like stretching the hose, hooking to a hydrant, searching for trapped people, venting the hot gases, and much more. For a low-hazard single-family house fire, NFPA 1710 specifies a minimum of 15 firefighters dispatched in the initial alarm. At an open-air strip shopping center or garden apartment fire, the standard specifies a minimum of 28 firefighters dispatched in the first alarm. And for fires in high-rise buildings at least seven stories tall, the data show that the initial dispatch should be for a minimum of 43 firefighters and that fire department should send additional firefighters to situations that are beyond the capability of the initial alarm. When considering crew size on each engine and truck responding to a fire, the standard says that in low hazard response areas like residential neighborhoods, the required number of firefighters on each fire engine and truck is four. In areas with a high number of incidents or geographic restrictions like narrow roads, single access bridges or islands. A minimum of five firefighters on each fire engine and ladder truck is required. And in dense urban areas with high hazard occupancies like high rise buildings, the minimum number of firefighters on each fire engine or truck is six. Regardless of the type of property, 1710 also sets the time of arrival on scene within four minutes for the first engine with four firefighters. The 1710 standard for both response time and crew size is based on scientific evidence, not opinion. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, known as NIST, and its partners conducted extensive research to document the optimal crew sizes for various types of structures. As a decision maker, you and firefighters share a common goal. Everyone gets out alive. So when a house is on fire, just remember, it takes a minimum of 15 firefighters to put it out. And the responding crews should have the right number of firefighters on each engine and truck. The quicker the response time, the better the outcome for everyone. For more information, Talk to your local firefighters. Thanks for listening, and stay safe. So, certainly we realize that the 1710 standard of looking at 48 firefighters for high hazards is not a realistic or attainable goal for our organization. So we go to the next standard in the list, which is 1720. 1720 is designed uh, as you'll read in your packet, for volunteer or combination uh, public fire department. So when we look at 1710, we look at uh, 1720 as the comparison, and we try to see where we are at as far as staffing and deployment resources. 1720, staffing and deployment, uh, what you'll see is they, they break it down per demand zone, an urban area with a thousand people or more, per square mile, a minimum staffing of 15 people within nine minutes, 90% of the time, okay? And as we start to decrease our demographics in our, throughout our demand zones, those numbers start to decrease. So really looking at our population center, our, our front royal community per se, our dense population, we, we do that as the comparison because that is going to be the most resource specific response area that we're going to have to meet out of this objective. So we look at 15 people within nine minutes, 90% of the time, and we really took it, or that, that hard dive into are we meeting those numbers? So if you look at our current resource deployment, uh, you see that we have a minimum of two people in each one of our respective staff stations. Our average turnout within the first uh, nine minutes of a fire incident is giving us approximately four to six volunteers coupled with our on-duty career staff. So we're not meeting that 15 people within nine minutes objective. Okay. 
So how can we start? How can we start to meet that 15 people on the incident 90% of the time within nine minutes? Um, is really what we really dove into and in how we started calculating that staffing plan. And we'll talk about that, that resource number and where we can increase our current staffing to help us meet that delivery system. So our calls for service, 2018, in 2018 we saw roughly a 14.4% increase from 2017. Over a 10 year period, we're seeing... That's fire and EMS. That's fire and EMS, that's correct. Um, over a 10 year period, we're looking at a 30.5% increase. A 20 year growth rate of our organization we're looking at a 1.3 person per year average in addition to our career staffing levels. So I, I, I've told Chief maybe many a times over many a years and I think he's done a superb job in keeping the rate of growth of the career system to a minimum. Because if we were to compare that to neighboring localities that started their career system at a later date, they far have exceeded that rate of growth number. Our yearly response comparisons, this kind of just gives you, Ms. Gladys, as you alluded to, fire versus EMS. Uh, we are an EMS-based organization. 80% okay? of what we do uh, is roughly EMS-based. Is roughly an EMS-based organization. So uh, right now, the 2018 statistics is roughly 84% uh, between counting motor vehicle accidents as an emergency medical call for service because likely they involve somebody that needs to be transported to the hospital. That puts us right around an 84% of what we want to see. Current operations staffing. So this is, this is solely a on-duty career firefighter comparison per locality that is surrounding us. There are two ways to look at it. We look at minimum staffing and we look at maximum staffing. Minimum staffing is the sheer minimum of people that we will have on duty at any given time. Maximum staffing is at any given time operations based. So that doesn't count Chief maybe myself or Rick Farrell who's also served in operations. This is just in a firehouse providing a service. We look at maximum staffing. So you heard us call for floaters, for example. Well, if nobody was off of work, that floater technically are going to be extra above your minimum staffing levels. So per, per capita staffing, Warren County right now, with a population of 39,630, our minimum staffing are 10 firefighters per day. But right now, one firefighter is providing a service to 3,963 uh, citizens. Um, so where we're at on that line, Page County, EMS-based career folks, Clark County, Fire and EMS-based career folks, and Rappahannock County with no career staff. Okay? Um, so we use that as our baseline. How are we doing? All right, how are we doing in comparison to the localities around us? Um, Frederick is getting ready to increase their numbers as soon as they uh, graduate or recruit school as well as Falk here. Falk here is getting ready to increase their numbers as well. And they did not have a number for uh, maximum staffing. Are they going to take some of those? Knock on wood, ma'am, no. We've been very, very fortunate uh, uh, with maintaining our employee base. So we have been very fortunate with nobody really jumping. We lost one employee last year uh, to go into work in private business. We did not lose an employee to another fire department. Okay. So, uh, so looking into our individual objectives, and I know I'm going through this pretty quick. If you have any questions, feel free to holler out. I know you've had a long morning already. Strategic staffing objective number one, and this is in no particular order. Okay, this is just, we see this as an objective. We need to work over the next five years to achieve this objective, and that's the staffing for our Rivermont station number two. This provides six additional staff members 
this will help alleviate the call pressures for station number one, as well as the call pressures for station number 10. When we redetailed uh, the staff members that were, current, that were at the previous Rivermont fire station to station three, that really left a hole in that service area of the Rivermont and Fort Smith communities. So that requires, or if we have no volunteer staff available, that, that service provider is coming from Front Royal or North Warren. What's unique with that is Front Royal and North Warren are our busiest response stations. So in our mind, anything we can do to alleviate the call pressures from those organizations is going to be an added benefit all right, to our overall responsibility. Strategic staffing objective number two, the increase of staffing of Front Royal Station number one. This is where we really start to get into looking at our safer grant and our funding mechanism of how are we going to pay for this? How are we going to implement this? This is an initial increase of three firefighter EMTs per shift at that station. That would give us five responders in our centrally located station per shift. Okay? Uh, what does that help us do? That help us meet that nine minute response objective. Okay? In addition to it start helps us meeting the staffing levels and response time for our outlying areas. Because again, we have that time benchmark. When you only have 10 firefighters on duty per day, and you have to meet that NFPA standard of 15, certainly it's going to take more than nine minutes for Shenandoah Farms to get to the town of Front Royal to meet that time objective. So certainly with Station 1 being geographically centered, ultimately they are the second due company, or at least third due company, to 95% of our response areas. All right, so that's why we're looking at that mechanism right there. What would that do for us? That helps us justify the 1720 mechanism to be eligible for the grant. All right, so it's really on how we, how do we meet that 1720 standard to be eligible for the grant funds. Our staffing objective number three is floater positions. I know we've been before this board talking about floater positions before. Uh, in 2018, um, you can see we had a lot of leave used from our full-time staff members. Uh, the year before, almost a 2,000 hour increase in leave use. We had multiple babies born from staff members, okay, so that took them out on FMLA, as well as we had some serious health issues that our employees were out on FMLA. So that really drove our leave usage up to 10,808 hours. In retrospect, we used approximately part time employees to cover roughly 40%, 45% of that. Our minimum staffing is our maximum staffing. So if somebody in operations calls in sick, we have to replace that position or that station gets marked out of service to the day. Um, in extreme cases, we'll make contact with the volunteer system. Hey, do you have anybody available that can backfill, that can hang out, either a partial shift until we can get somebody in there. So we have those resources and we do that where the time allows, uh, or I fill, or uh, firefighter EMT Rick Farrell out of the administration will backfill those positions. Um, but when you look at that, it really affects our staffing levels to be able to do that. Um, sometimes we are faced with, hey, I have to steal your firefighter EMT to go fill this position in a higher call volume station. And what that typically does is leaves the South Warren station with one person. Okay, so to be able to decrease our staffing in that one particular station in extreme case. What we can do with this is as we add floater positions, what that really does is eliminates our part-time and overtime budget. Okay, these are very rough preliminary numbers. Okay, we did not have time to really dive in and figure out how many true hours of my salary per se was spent in actual overtime expenditures because of leave use. Okay, by the time we get to this, we will have that data readily available 
than this board. Strategic staffing objective number four, certainly as we talk about increasing our size uh, and our response capabilities, we start looking at adding employees, we start to see uh, the demands placed on the office of the fire chief, and we're going to ask for the addition of an assistant chief, ultimately somebody to work with our fire administration, uh, our career volunteer responders to really help the fire chief's office, the administration, finish to achieve our objectives and goals, as well as re-implementation of our training captain or a training officer within fire administration. We lost that position several years ago due to a medic vacancy. That was a temporary reassignment and we've just never been able to refill or backfill that assignment. Okay. Um, our staffing objective number five is increase our uh, community volunteer recruitment and retention. We certainly look at our recruitment numbers and one thing that we've been able to identify over the last several years is we do not per se have a recruitment problem. We can get people, we can get them to fill out an application, we can get them at least interested to attend the entry level uh, functions. Uh, we have a retention problem and we really have to dive into the who, what, when, where, and why. One of the things we're seeing now is as our volunteers age, um, as political climates change within our respective volunteer organizations, today's world it is just too easy to walk away. And I say that realistically, everybody's been involved in some type of volunteer function, be a, a civic group, a church, <laughs> something like that. We have those types of aspects. How do we keep that person when they're ready to just throw the towel in, to toss their hat back in the ring? How do we get them to just reconsider and rethink about what am I really going to lose? So one of the things that we've explored with our volunteer system is a low SAP program or a length of service awards program. Uh, your document's going to detail kind of a, a, a quick overview of what a low SAP program is but it's really a volunteer retirement system, okay? And as that volunteer starts to provide a commitment to the fire and rescue department, to the community, uh, really, it's a retirement system. So based off of the length of service, um, as well as uh, the commitment that they've provided. So you would have certain objectives that they have to meet, certain parameters that they have to meet, and all of that would have to be worked out. But what this implementation plan, what this staffing plan does, is it really gives us the ability to start earmarking money and putting money aside because it's going to be a substantial start up to be able to implement that program. Okay, so this earmarks approximately $30,000 a year to, to kind of bank that money to when we're ready to set the parameters, when we're ready to work with the low SAT vendors to be able to implement that, uh, to be able to have that resource readily available uh, for you, the board, to make that decision. In addition to uh, evaluating a pay per staff um, hour program, okay, so what is the incentive uh, to get these volunteer responders to the fire station as an example? We looked at a pay per call system. Uh, some localities throughout Virginia, uh, <coughs> other areas of the, of the United States are doing a pay per call. That's more of a volunteer station dependent, so that volunteer organization offers that pay per call. The problem in our system is if we offered a pay per call, we would be robbing Peter to pay Paul. Meaning, would I go to Rivermont, who runs 500 calls a year, and staff to get paid per call, or would I go to the central station and get 10 calls a day versus maybe one call a day over here? So what we feel that would do to our system is pull the emergency responders from one station and put them in the busiest stations and our outlying stations would be understood. What this does um, is based off of your EMS certification <coughs> level or your capabilities, i.e. driver, operator, EMT, paramedic, from that, you know, you sign up for a four hour staffing block, a volunteer crew, and for that four hour staffing block based off of your certification level you would just get a stipend for x number of dollars okay we would have to set the parameters for that 
because IRS allows us to give a stipend up to a certain amount. So this would cap all right, at some point in time. All right? But just different ways to evaluate of how do we put the responders in the station to certainly help us meet that 1720 standard. Our implementation plans. So again, looking at three implementation plans is looking at staggering personnel without grant funding assistance. If you go to your packet in the implementation plan on page 14, that will show you an implementation option of taking and staggering these positions without grant funding assistance. And at the end of five years, ultimately you're looking at a $5.1 million investment. Okay? So I don't, I don't like that look. So I apologize. <laughs> Implementation option number two is now starting to look at potential grant funding options. If we were to hire 26 people year one, get grant funding for those that are eligible, what would that do? Certainly that's actually a higher expenditure. That's a higher expenditure because you're bringing them all on day one. Okay, that's a 5.9, almost a 5.6 million dollar expenditure. Implementation option number three. Implementation option number three is certainly we understand that, uh, and again, we're not here today to ask for a commitment. What we're here is to say, you know, I don't, let me break out my used car salesman and, hey, sign on the dotted line and we'll, everybody will walk away. Okay, um, that's a good deal. What, what we're looking at is what can, how can we get grant funding assistance? We have not been successful with grant funding, uh, how can we meet those objectives? Do we ask for three, do we ask for six? What is our ultimate goal to be able to meet that grant fund? My, my opinion standing before you today is for us to meet in FPA 1720 uh, and to provide the best possible level of service to our current call demands, we would apply for a grant for 15 staff members, okay? That 15 staff members would be used to strategically place additional staffing throughout the community. Ultimately, that 15 increases the staffing at Front Royal Station 1, as well as provides your staffing for North War, uh, I'm sorry, Rivermont Station 2. Okay? What that does is the reason we're asking for 15 is that's going to centrally locate. Uh, the bulk of our responders per day that would increase our daily staffing to Front Royal Fire Station to five. Uh, I'm going to do that now. At that station? No, 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 all together. Ten. 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 Uh, so this would increase our daily staffing to add 15 people to place at Front Royal St Station one to increase that staffing to five and staff Rivermont with two that would increase our daily staffing to 15. Question. Mm -hmm. In applying for a grant, what typically, what is the period of time, if, I mean, how long is it good for if you, if you apply for a grant? How many years will you be able to get it for typically? So the grant provides funding for three years. Mm -hmm. So once you're awarded the grant, they give you a period of time to hire the employees. Okay, the first year of the SAFER grant covers 75% of the cost. The second year of the grant again provides funding for 75% of the cost. The third year of the grant covers 35% of the cost. Okay, then it's now it becomes your baby. So, um, so with that, that shows you, for example, just looking at the increase of Station 1 staffing, nine responders in the first year is going to cost you roughly $135,000 out of pocket. Second year same. Third year, that's going to cost you $351,000. The fourth year, that increase is going to cost you five hundred and four. dollars So ideally, you're building the budget each year, working towards it, even though it's flat for the first two, that you sock some additional resources away to be able to. That's correct. And how are we going to build the budget? Well, the good news is, if you look at the, the date, we're not talking until 2021 where Rivermont opens. We can apply for the SAFER grant in the spring, but you don't have to include any of this, you don't have to include any of this money in the upcoming budget. It's 
the year after yeah. that, that it would take effect. Obviously, if you could stick some money aside, that'd be great. We know it's going to be a tight budget year. But I think it's, it's really about, you know, we're not building a six, seven million dollar station to have it sit empty. We know there's a hole in our system right now with Rivermont. Uh, we've been talking about eventually staffing there anyway. So it's really about, again, this is our vision statement for our rescue is one of our issues. Um, and that Jerry and Chief have been tasked to look at the five-year window of what do we need. And, and he knows, I, you know, I said, maybe you, he's 20, the likelihood of getting all 26 positions in five years, unless some miracle uh, money trade drops out of the sky, pretty tough. But give us something, give us some options that, um, something we can implement. And certainly the grant would be Who helpful. Would be competing with? Is it statewide? No, this is a nationwide yeah, grant. Nationwide. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But you don't, you don't know if you, you yeah. don't swing, you don't get a hit. Right. So you got right. How does Chester Gap and Middletown fit into this? I know we pay for their service, we reciprocate green. Does that, can we bring this into this equation or is that a done deal once you achieve the goal? In the equation of main. So, Right now, Middletown has provided their staffing from Frederick County. Yes. So Frederick County provides Middletown 24-hour career staffing. Right now, Chester Gap is the Rappahannock County station, and Rappahannock oh, County does not provide that. Uh, in addition to, if they're correct, they're all volunteer station, they're all volunteer county. Um, if you look at our own department, this five-year plan does not call for the staffing of existing volunteer dependent stations other than Rivermont. So this plan does not call for staffing station five or eight. Okay, and that's really looking at call volume. Now that may change, and this plan certainly could change overnight because you know, you don't know where Fort Smith's going to be in five years. You don't know where Station 5 is going to be. Hopefully, we, we were able to work with the volunteer agencies and increase their staffing levels, but you just don't know. So we have to look at our projections based off of today's data. Um, you know, so certainly Chester Gap. Um, Chester Gap is unique because they provide a level of service to us. We fund them for that. We provide a level of service to them. So certainly, without a career response system, they are volunteer dependent. In addition to, you all know, and we've been before you many a times, ALS responders are very hard to come by, and particularly at that volunteer level. So as their volunteer numbers start to decrease, you start to see their available ALS response decrease. So it's, it, is, it is not uncommon for our ALS responders at Front Royal Station 1 to be in Flint Hill as an example. Uh, vice versa, the Chester Gap area uh, over top of the, the, the Rappahannock oh, yeah. County line. So uh, you provide service to us, we'll provide service to you kind of thing. Um, and we get that same service from Middleton. Correct. Yeah. They provide a service for us. We are, we are pretty unique that we funding outside volunteer agencies to provide services to our citizens. Uh, you don't see that a lot. There's a lot of sandbox issues with, you know, fire departments, as everybody's well aware, and we just, we don't have them. You know, hey, you're closer, provide the level of service, you're closer, provide the level of service. Some farms would probably be providing a lot for Clark. That is correct, yep. So, um, so again, that 1720 standard, again, we, we add 15, if we increase our staffing with putting in for a grant for 15 responders, that increases our daytime, nighttime, minimum staffing to 15, we still are a volunteer dependent agency. To be able to meet that NFPA 1720 objective, we would still have to have volunteer responders, okay? Uh, and that's what this one kind of shows. This kind of shows here, if we increase, uh, at the end of five years, what does our staffing levels look like? We would initially hire the 15, put an extra three people per day, then when we're ready down the road to hire a, 
we can hire three additional staff members from North Warren to increase their response, pull the fifth responder from Front Royal, put it North Warren. That increases our staffing to four, four, two, 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 and two. Yes, okay. Same. Um then looking at the potential for if we just stayed with our statistical response of six volunteers, average nine minute turnout, as well as two to four floaters. Where does that put us in comparison? Looking at projected staffing levels today, we are at the peak. Okay? Uh, we are providing one firefighter per 3,963 citizens. Uh, with 15, we would be able to reduce that to 2,642. Then our optimal uh, 26 new positions or a minimum staffing of 16 on a 24 hour period we would be providing one career person per every 2,477 to just show you a comparison. Again, this has been nothing more than evaluating our past to prepare for our future. Okay, where, where have we been? Where are we going? As Chief kind of mentioned that we've never had anything like this within our organization. It's really been at when budget time hits, what do we think we need and let's go for that uh, and come to you and, and really pay help us out type deal. this really kind of gives us a plan to work towards as well as a document for you as our, our elected officials and decision-making body to use in that decision-making process again it's a vital tool for our planning process uh, it's a continual evaluation period as I talked about, we don't know what changes we're going to be hit with. We don't know what type of training mandates are going to be there in, in five years. We don't know what we don't know, if that makes any sense. Uh, so we have to use today's data to plan for the next five years. Um, and again, uh, it's, a, it's a volunteer and community focus. Uh, we really are striving to work with our volunteer system to identify our strengths and weaknesses. Brenda, as Chief alluded to, is going to come out with a detailed report for, for this board. Um, she's done a great job in identifying those strengths and weaknesses to really try to figure out what can we do to increase our applicant pool, what can we do to increase our, our available volunteer responders. Um, and with that, who, who's ready to sign? No. I have to have it set out. I have a question perhaps for our county administrator. How would this impact our, our tax rate on a five year basis? Well if you look at the yeah. if you're just looking purely at five million dollars it's twelve pennies for the current tax rate. Now obviously I think you have to look at the potential to grow into it over a five year period so that as additional revenue hopefully comes in, you can you know, it, it's up. You guys have a tough job. You've got the schools that need money. You've got peers, sure, all these different uh, needs, and you've got to prioritize. And I think that the good part is that visioning process is going to help us do a little bit of that. There will be some additional revenue and stuff coming in. We, as we know we need to make uh, an investment. I think the tr trigger right now is simply, and it doesn't cost you anything, but basically, what's the deadline for the safer grant? Technically, it hasn't even opened yet. So when they so open year, the yeah, grant, they will announce the deadline for so March. April. So uh, statistically, the grant opens end of February. All right. Grant Time be on that. Yeah, um, with staff from Fire and Rescue to put it together. I the, number one is I think you can apply for the grant whether you accept. I think that's number one. Right. And really, we're talking another fiscal year out. I think it really comes down to are we heading in the, in the right direction? Um, you, you're not professional. We don't have a. If our fire and rescue is not where it should be, it's awful hard to attract businesses because they're looking at your educational level, transportation, your public safety. All that is looked at when a, a team is looking at the located facility. So, this is one of the pieces of the puzzle to bring better paying jobs to the area. I mean, between now and then, do you want do you want Chief to take this to the Chief's Advisory Committee and get some feedback from the volunteer chiefs? I mean, he hasn't done it. That can be, we've got some time. 
in the next couple months to go get yeah. the feedback. We I mean, obviously, if you're an unstaffed station, you may say, I want to staff. Well, that's and that's going, to be, that's going to be the hard part, and that's why we felt to present this document here first, because we, we have volunteer organizations that want staffing. Yeah. Do we meet the 1720 standard by providing them two staff members per day on a 24-hour basis? Or do we increase our staffing at this? Which one is more uh, community focused, i.e., where, where are we going to get the best bang for our buck? And, and, you know, that's going to be a challenge. You may have a volunteer organization that says, I'm not going to approve this, I'm not going to support this unless it calls for staffing my station. Uh, and, and unofficially, we've been told that. You know, what you're saying from the numbers I saw on your slide. It's really 16 staff, not 15. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 15 for the grant mm -hmm. will help us achieve that 1720 standard. Oh, okay. That's by staffing Rivermont and increased staffing up front. That gives us a big the, leg up. The yeah. end of five years. So I don't want to be focused. I don't want to say, hey, if we get the grant, the end of five years, we're going to we're going to meet our target. That's not that's not the case. So for example. Uh, the training position and an assistant chief are not eligible for grant funding because they're not operational dedicated, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So, so that support position would not meet that. Uh, so you would increase your staff size theoretically by 15 uh, so with one line. with one one administrator. Not going to rush with the bottom yes. line, but look, if we did option three, what's the increase in revenue? Well, it's, once the grant goes away, it was a half a million. Remember, what would your annual cost once the grant goes away? Jim? Once the grant goes away, so year three, uh, that would be a 1.45 on today's budget. Year, year three is 35 percent. Year three is 35 percent. So year four, like cost would be three cents. But again, I'd say you build towards that. It's like when we built a school. You know, we would build towards it. So you don't end up with sticker shock at the end of the day. If we got the grant, if the board decided to accept it, then we know, okay, we've got to build into our budget X dollars to be able to pick our own. Would you, would you yeah, we're, not, we're not asking anybody to make the decision here. We know that when the time comes, what we want to do is we want to present you, our decision makers, with a document, with a long-term plan on, hey, this is what the fire chief foresees that we're going to need the next well, five years. I think we need to ask. I mean, we do. We, 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 we need to go ask. reach out. Yeah. So I think maybe between now and the next month or two, y'all yeah. take it to the chief advisory committee, get some type of recommendation from them or feedback. You know, they, and they may not support it, but get feedback. At the end of the day, the board will have to make that decision. But we'll put it on a board agenda to author, you know, maybe accept the yep. draft staff exactly. plan and authorize you to apply for the safer grant this round. And that gives us direction to move forward. It doesn't commit us on funding until we know if we get the grant or not. That's right. And if we don't get the grant, you know, then we're still going to have to look at it. And that was the other, you know, the aspect. Because we don't the get the grant doesn't mean we don't. We're not asking for it. Yeah. Right. But what I would ask you to do is once you work with your chiefs, the volunteer chiefs, is maybe have a community meeting in each of the locations and present what you're trying to do so people understand that you're being extremely aggressive. You're not sitting on your hands and that you've actually put together a five-year plan for the first time. So you're showing activity and you're doing it for the right reason in the right direction. And you may get 10 people to come out, you may get 100, but if you tell 10, 100 is going to know. So a small turnout doesn't mean it's not successful. I really think you have to communicate with the, uh, sure. the general sure. public so they understand that there's a cause for public safety. Sure. And keep in mind, keep in mind too, over the period we've applied for grants and so and, forth. And yeah. to answer Ms. Lavis, yeah, we're competing with Fairfax and Arlington, oh. and, uh, they, uh, because of the size of those departments now, it's less a request from them to meet these uh, these objectives than it is for us, and that's the big thing: is moving toward meeting these objectives. Um, you need to tell them we need to. Why? 
They really feel it's more <laughs> the rural. The rural they don't, or, or, don't the rural, think they don't. You would think it's more the rural that will put in for this than the major cities. Well, one of the biggest problems is, is you have departments put in for it, they get awarded the grant. At the end of three years, they're laying off 15 people because they just they can't keep up the cost of things. I think, I think you know, so we have to be prepared. I think we have a good story, especially when they look at our investment in a new station in an underserved area of the county. And the issues that we've had with the current building and all that, I think it makes for a good story. What we're doing and the fact that we need to staff it once we get it completed. Well, and, and it, as Chief alluded to in years past, we haven't been successful in these grants, and, and really we didn't have a document to really base the grant request off of. And this really helps us sew up that process to really, when we write the grant, not only are we meeting the 1720 standard, this is why. It's kind of like when you go ask for five people, five people doesn't really do anything for meeting the 1720. I understand. And uh, usually you just get X right that's, out. That's the great uh, printing, you know, because of that. Well, that sounds like something we could certainly grow into yes. over a period of five years. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, certainly we appreciate y'all's time. I know it's been a very long day. I know that was a lengthy presentation, but uh, it's super important for us. And uh, we look forward to your continued support.